Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 633, the Thanksgiving Week edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. Today's November 24th, 2020. All right, now, this is the, the magic of technology. We are here at the, the Jetty Campground at Cocoa Beach on the very edge here of the uh, Atlantic Ocean uh, where they, they launch those little SpaceX satellite rockets. And I have one bar, yet George is still clearly present on the screen. No, I'm not using the campground Wi-Fi. They don't have any here, but... Uh, uh, I have this huge antenna now on top of my uh, RV, and we're able to get a good enough signal. Uh, he'll probably pause once in a while. That's not George. That's the video. But <laughs> this is a one-bar recording brought to you by at and uh, George, how you doing this Thanksgiving week? Just great, Kevin. Uh, friends, our viewers at home, I am in the process of sending out and writing stewardship letters. Uh... If you... <laughs> would like to receive one of these stewardship letters let me know uh this is a really exciting time it's a stewardship campaign when we can't do stewardship events that's right we can't have Teas parish you, in yeah. the past we would have people have have hold events at their houses and mm -hmm. uh, at homes and uh uh we'd have parish meetings after church and none of that can happen in COVID. So it's a campaign driven by social media and paper. And I've, I've asked a few members of the congregation to get out their cell phones and record two or three minute video of why they give. And I've uh, excited, optimistic that it'll all work out, but uh, gosh, it's, it's exciting. Let's well, see, it's a new thing. We had a, uh, our vestry meeting last night, parish council meeting, sorry, it's, it's that's what they call themselves and lo and behold we're at 99 percent of uh, uh income for the year uh which is a revenue income and i'm like wow Whew, dodged a bullet in covid you know a, a lot of churches right now are not uh getting as much money because sadly some members have died uh and people who don't attend and uh aren't really participating don't feel the need to give as much well trust me your church needs the money you, you promised on your pledge card whether or not you go to church or not COVID is uh certainly not taking away the expenses of church in, in traditional fashion for sure one of the things i discovered doing my preparation is i have the largest church in the diocese where i'm a one-man band mm -hmm. everybody else my size has paid assistance I have deacons, four deacons, but I'd I'd love to bring on, and I'm asking the congregation to help me bring on a part-time assistant, because there's just so much going on, so much excitement, so much we need to do. Uh, and the thing with COVID is that I am spending more and more and more time in front of the camera and doing pastoral work. And, you know, some clergy have looked at the COVID time as a time just to relax you take care of that that bad get golf handicap it's it's time to get out there and work on that yes but i have to tell you i have never been busier doing sure. the work of the parish than i have in these past months yeah. it's incredible mm -hmm. uh, but it's exciting all right so i believe god is going to be doing great things here oh yeah i mean i think covid is the church's opportunity uh it's a reset in the church for what's important where clearly community is important uh, the relationships are very important, and stuff that we've kind of overlooked in the past uh, century uh, is very important to the life of the church. One of the things I've noticed is that it's shaken the box, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's taken the it's taken all the chess checker and chess pieces off the board, thrown them up in the air, and they're starting to come down. And what I mean by that is that. I'm having visitors. We have much, much reduced congregation, but I'm still getting two or three visitors each week who are checking us out, and they go to other churches, and their other churches, they've been away for six months, and now they've started up too, but people are basically testing the waters, and I think our people are testing the waters too. 
So I think one of the things that we'll see is a winnowing. Is that the right word? Yeah, I, want? yeah. Uh, I once said willowing with the L. It's winnowing with the N. <laughs> a winnowing as congregations uh, either... Uh, I don't want to sound Darwinian and everything, but, you know, it's survival of the fittest out there right now for your parish church. Yeah. And if you don't adapt, if you, you're not going to survive. I have churches that have been in contact with me who are finally coming online on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, it took them this long. You know, we're six, seven, well, no, we're ten months in. Jeez. Uh, ten months into our shutdown, and they're finally coming online. And I don't know if these churches are going to survive. Uh, you know, clearly 90% of churches were, or 85% of churches were online within the first uh, 90 days. And then there's stragglers who are finally coming online now. They just say, well, we thought we could wait out COVID. I guess we can't. We have to do something. Where our church is kind of like, well, we're going to do the annual meeting online. We're going to do parish councils online. We're doing everything we can online for the immediate future until further notice um connecticut is in lockdown uh again i think they're like on wave eight you know they they never had any major death rate but uh everything more than 10 people in the hospital to connecticut that's a wave okay just like we're another wave <laughs> well in florida the governor's promised no more lockdowns mm -hmm. and uh kevin you, you you've been around and then about uh Life is pretty normal here, but at you know, my wife Susan and daughter Claudia in Seattle and my other daughter in San Francisco area, they can't leave the house. They can't eat out. Uh, they can order takeout, and I get the little credit card buzz whenever they do <laughs> on my machine. Thing. Oh, my. Well, it's interesting. You know, because of our travels and stuff like that, the most consistent place to go for uh, shopping is like a, a Walmart. You, you know where it is in the section. You can go in, go in, and quick. Because uh, every Walmart is basically laid out the same. I have noticed over the last 10 months, people are willing to dress up a little bit more when they go to Walmart because they're wearing a mask. Well, if I'm going to wear a mask, I may as well dress up a little bit more. The, uh, the pajama gangs aren't showing up in Walmart. The people who put their underwear on uh, in the wrong timing... Yeah, on the outside of the pants are not at Walmart like they you were a year ago, George. So uh, I guess the, pat, the the mask lets people dress up a little. If you disagree, put it in the comments. But yeah, one thing I found is uh, we do a, I do a nightly Compline service, ten o'clock every night, seven days a week. We have Compline, six seven minutes. That has developed an online audience that rivals the Sunday service. Um, people from around the world, I get little notes, hi, I'm watching from Australia, watching from South Africa, watching from England, watching from Okeechobee. Uh, uh, the Compline Hooterville. service. And I, well, Okeechobee is where the people from Hooterville go That's to right. go to the wall. Uh, oh my, but what I've, several things here one i believe the brevity of the service seven eight minutes it's concentrated it's focused just a straight prayer service and is attractive to people mm -hmm. because if i look at most online church services they basically trying to move what they do in church on sunday onto the small screen i do that too but i don't think that's the future of online uh, worship. Um, I, I don't think people can sit still for an hour and a half. Uh, it, there there is the a, a dichotomy because over time, uh, at least the last 30 years, we have subjected our attention span to, I'd say right now we're about 16 and a half to 17 minutes is what we can, we can handle in a one sitting when we're watching a YouTube video, an instruction video, um, and something like that. There are We have dedicated fans who watch Unscripted, and we complain when we go beyond 30 minutes. They're like, no, 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 you, we'd watch you for three hours. There are those people out there. 
the majority of people who watch Anglican Scripted watch it for 17 to 19 minutes, and then you, if you're watching the graph, they, they slowly click off to the point where we're at, we get to the 40 minute mark, we're at 80% of the original audience. Uh, people just, they just don't have the time in their day, understandable. Uh, they don't have the attention span, understandable, because you were brought up in the Captain Kangaroo generation, and they don't have the motivation unless a lot of people, about 10% uh, of our audience, just skip around when they watch the video. You can see, you know, they stop here, they start there, they stop here, they're, they're looking for the news. They want to get, this is the banter we have, they want to get beyond the pre-banter, the first three minutes, and, and make it to the news. We have it. What, we're 11 minutes in, we haven't made it to the news, George. George, you told me there's a lot of news, lots of little stories. Let's let's do that. What do you got? A big. We have a big story out of uh, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the circuit court covering the southeast Florida federal mm -hmm. court system. Uh, so, uh, the town of Boca Raton in Florida passed an ordinance banning conversion therapy. Conversion therapy is counseling to uh, get rid of unwanted same-sex attractions. Offered. This at, has been really. It was. Let's be certain here. It's offered at a secular and Christian level. Yeah, you don't. You don't have to go to a Christian. It may counselor. not even be Christian. Either. Right. It. It could be a, a psychologist. It could be a marriage and family counselor. It could be a Christian counselor. Mm -hmm. The Church of England has weighed in on this, saying that this is evil and terrible. You cannot do this. You cannot pray the gay away. Is the the refrain that we're having. And the court in the United States said bans on conversion therapy are unconstitutional. And what was fascinating is to see the judges' opinions. Three judge panel, two were appointed by President Trump, one by President Obama. The Trump judges said, let's put aside the issue of whether same-sex homosexuality is morally good or morally bad. We're going to treat it as morally neutral. The issue is, what right does the state have to limit speech if the person engaged in the therapy is voluntarily there. Correct. So that if, if you go and if, and if you take your child or if you go yourself and you wish to be treated for this, the state has no right under the, pre under the protections of the U.S. Constitution to say you can't do this. It's a free speech issue. The Obama judge said, free speech be damned. Uh, you cannot... Uh, infringe upon the gay rights movement and so we really are seeing in this a little microcosm of the conflict between uh liberals and and conservatives in the courts and in the political world it's not that conservatives are unanimous in saying homosexuality is bad or homosexuality is good but rather you have the freedom of choice you cannot be compelled to do something or not do something um, well, I mean, fascinating case. Well, it, it, and that's you're going to see this repeated now for at least the next four years, when people take their cases in front of conservative courts, i.e., the uh, Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, they're going to be very surprised by the reaction they're getting. Uh, yes, courts will still be divided because they're not completely conservative, but these are uh, justices and judges that are looking now at the Constitution as the guide not emotion, uh, where the wind is blowing, uh, activism, and other things. What are the constitutional protections that are guided by what you're, you're claiming here in court? Yeah. The, you have an absolute right to free speech. You cannot be compelled to be quiet mm -hmm. uh, just because people disagree with you. Um, we're actually seeing that. We're transferring now to the Church of England scene. We're seeing people demanding silence from conservative, traditionalists, evangelicals on the homosexuality issue. Writing in Via Media, which is the website, uh, her website, uh, Jane Ozan, a uh, member of the, well, she might be a past member of the Archbishop's Council, past I can't one, yes, remember yeah. her status. Yeah. She has demanded that the government launch an inquiry uh, into conservative evangelical theology on human sexuality, saying, uh, likening it to rape or, or child abuse, and saying that uh, it's a safeguarding issue where the church says that homosexuality is a sin. Um, 
Well, she is trying to compel silence on this issue, that if you disagree with her, the power of the state can be used to shut you down. Um, well, here's England's the unwritten constitution may or may not survive this attack. I, I got to tell you, it wouldn't happen here. No, well, it's been successful in the European Union, and I think she's going to try and use that in the UK. Um, you're putting God on trial, and uh, mm -hmm. over time, putting God on trial is certainly Christ on trial. Good things happen. I don't know if putting the church on trial in weakened Church of England is going to do the Church of England any good. Yeah. Well, this is all in the English scene. It's all coming out of the LLF uh, yeah. uh, paper, but more particularly the Ch uh, Church of England Evangelical Council released a very polished professional video offering their views on human sexuality. And you would think that uh, Jan Ozan and Colin Coward and others were, were cats that were scalded by boiling water or something. The uh, uh, reminded of that passage uh, uh, from the Gospels of the demon shouting out, Jesus, who are you to do all this? I mean, their reaction is almost New Testament uh, response of the demonic to the presence of the holy. Uh, no, it was that they are so angry with the Church of Even England Evangelical Council that Jane Ozan is basically trying to criminalize their point of view. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's a, we'll, we'll put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, it's uh, well done. Uh, I want to congratulate the people who put that together um, because you know, you're on the right side here. And uh, I, I, I like it when you are willing to take up the task of uh, providing a counterpoint to all the craziness going on at the uh, clergy level in the Church of England. It's, it's insane. And part of my Thanksgiving is the Evangelical Council. Um, what else we got there in news? That you have the whole list in front of you. Well, this is the great time for Justin Welby to take a sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> oh, he announced the General Senate this week that he's taken off uh, June, July, end of May, June, July, beginning of August next mm -hmm. year, 2021, for a sabbatical. Will the Church of England now, friends, survive? Now, friends, I got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Will the Church of England survive? It will probably flourish when he's gone. But this is one of my pet peeves. Uh, now, don't hear me wrong. If you're a priest and you're offered a sabbatical, take it. Absolutely. It's money left sure. on the table. It's for you. Don't mm. turn your nose up at it. But I just think it's such a bad idea. I mean, it just reinforces the image. The clergy don't work very hard. They're overpaid. They're it's just not a real profession that these that you need to take three months off um if you need it for medical reasons do so but kevin what's your experience been in this I, <laughs> well my my experience and now i've been in the church since i was a little itty bitty guy um my experience is when a sabbatical is offered and taken um and we're 75 percent of the the priests that i've been with over uh, these many years have said, have come back and said, "I'm being led to go to another church." You know, the, the, well gone. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, "You guys are doing great," and I can take my skill set and a ten percent bonus and a big pay increase and go to St. John's in the town over. And but but hear me correctly, the the stresses involved in a clergy job. If they offer you a sabbatical, do take it. Um, my experience is when people come back from sabbatical, they come back with a renewed vision and a renewed desire to open those uh, search committee letters from other churches, and uh, they spend much too. If you can send your clergy on sabbatical and hide all the search committee letters, that's fine. That's what you need to do. <laughs> that's my final word. See. My well, my worldview is that I cannot imagine not doing. I could just as much take a sabbatical from breathing or speaking, sure, as I could for, from being a uh, to preach the gospel. Yeah, you can change. You can change locations. You can change jobs. This and that. But to take time off to stare at your navel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm studying. Yeah, right. You know, pull the other one. 
Um, it just speaks to the unseriousness of, uh, to, to my mind, because, you know, the work that we are called to do is so vital and pressing. It's like saying to Winston Churchill, okay, the Germans are at the channel. You haven't had a sabbatical in seven yeah, years. Maybe, maybe you take three months off. Three, you know, uh, Hitler will wait. Yeah. Oh goodness. Well, I you know, but I, I'm divided. I'm agnostic on sabbaticals. You know, I've seen them work, but in in the majority of times, I've seen them not work. My position, therefore, is to say, let's work this out in the comments. If you have taken a sabbatical and and come back refreshed and it's helped your church, please add that to the comments. If your priest or yourself have gone on sabbatical and you come back and you left the church, please put that in the comments. I'd, I'd like to see uh, how this works out. Well, I have to say that I do have some pet peeves. Mm -hmm. Skinny jeans on priests, <laughs> little 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 chin things I, how with about the no mustache or whatever on clergy. I love the Hawaiian shirt collar shirt. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's certain things that just... <sighs> the cassock alb uh there's just some things that just cause me to be cranky and irrational and sabbaticals is one of them oh my all right what else have we got in the news you have the whole uh, today you have well, the we list can talk about cranky and irrational cranky and irrational that means the episcopal church doesn't it yes it does that the uh, episcopal church uh got their clock cleaned by the Texas Supreme Court back in May. Mm -hmm. In a unanimous decision, the Texas Supreme Court upheld the Ryan Reed Jack Eicher Diocese of Fort Worth's claims to all of its property, its name. Uh, it was a unanimous decision. Based on um, neutral principles. Finding that under. Yeah. Yeah. And you can look at some of our Alan Haley's old films with Kevin, where he goes into detail what this means. Uh, the Episcopal Church has filed a writ of search, a petition for a writ of certiorari to the U.S. Supreme Court. So it's moved up to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court doesn't have to take it, and they don't take the vast majority of those questions. But the Episcopal Church has said that separation of church and state requires the, the state to defer to the church's interpretation of its own rules. So you can't apply property rules and title deeds. You have to apply what the General Convention says or what Catherine Jeffrey Chory says, <laughs> yes, not uh, what the pieces of paper say. And the uh, Diocese of Fort Worth uh, has till December 23rd, I think, to file a response brief uh, to this case. Mm -hmm. um, but actually thinking about it, uh, Kevin, you mentioned this might actually be a great time for the U.S. Supreme Court to take it up. Well, the, um, the federal courts and the federal appeals courts and the U.S. Supreme Court have all been balanced conservative now after four years of Trump. And I would really be interested if the Supreme Court took this case and said, you know, it's time that we settled neutral principles in the uh, Christian and the church realm and the secular realm once and for all. And why don't we handle a couple of the other things? Well, I could, you know, I could, I could tell you they would ra much rather do the Episcopal Church versus the Diocese of Fort Worth Ooh. than Trump versus Biden. I know <laughs> they would rather you <laughs> spend their time on that one than uh, what would probably be coming down the pike. Yeah, and yeah. in South Carolina, mm -hmm. the Episcopal Church is doing the same thing, but instead of taking it to the U.S. Supreme Court. They're asking the South Carolina Supreme Court to basically enforce their crappy ruling of a few years ago where there were five different opinions and no, it, you know, is it, is it unworkable? One of the mo most unlawyerly, uh, uh, un, un judicial fiascos of modern American jurisprudence. And so the S Episcopal Church and the Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina because they got the tight name back, but they didn't get the property, have uh, asked the South Carolina court to uh, basically give them all the property again. And they're, the judges who caused all the havoc, one has recused himself, two have retired. So you may get a new slate of judges who won't be corrupted like the one judge 
one woman judge on South Carolina, her husband was an activist for the Episcopal faction. Uh, she was prejudiced. She just was, it was textbook example, uh, I think the professor at the University of South Carolina Law School said, of uh, why you need to have, to have recusals if you have a personal interest in a Absolutely. case. Absolutely. And of course, of course she didn't. So I think the political makeup of the court uh, will uh, give the Anglican faction a uh, final win. Uh, I, I mean, now, of course, they got to spend money to do that, but hey. I don't know if I have time to put in the show notes, but if you ever get a chance to watch the video of the uh, um, the case, the judge that we're talking about was literally cross-examining the uh, attorney for the Diocese of South Carolina. And it was just an embarrassment. You could see the other judges being clearly, visibly disturbed by her uh reaction and questioning of, of this attorney what was happening and I, I remember watching i remember speaking to some people who attended it and I, what happened you know i this isn't how supreme courts are you know, state supreme courts are supposed to work i said no that's how uh we have recusals she was clearly uh, uh affected by her emotions and uh, her desire to have a result at the supreme court level and she got what she wanted five different opinions hmm. what else you got George well I've got something that th this will upset people uh, some people we had a we had a bishop in uh, Canada Eastern Newfoundland and it was reported in October that he passed away suddenly and he was roughly our age he's in his late 50s and I started getting were a word from people that you need to look into this. You need to look into this. And finally, I'd, I was unable to unearth that he took his own life, mm -hmm. that he had suffered from severe. He had suffered from depression and had committed suicide. I took this from sources in the diocese and went to the administrative archdeacon, the man administering the diocese, and they wouldn't respond, wouldn't even say yes, wouldn't say no. And now, some background, those who know me know that my brother committed suicide. Uh, he had been mentally ill, he had schizophrenia. And we all, I think all of our Americans are familiar with the case of Robin Williams, mm -hmm. who took his own life uh, in the depths of depression. And I think hiding the suicide or refusing to talk about it and not addressing head on the issues of depression and mental illness uh, last suicide I can remember of a bishop was the Bishop of Massachusetts who had been caught in moral acts. He was, he, he was a serial adulterer and he took his own life out of shame. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, people being people, if they hear the bishop, they'll hear, it's not, it's going to come out that he committed suicide. And if you cover it up, people are going to assume, well, well, what was he doing? He was so ashamed that he had to kill himself. But if you can use this tragedy as a teaching moment, to say, you know, if you have depression, there are resources. And you just, what it speaks to me is of a, of a church culture that is unwilling to grapple with the reality of sin and brokenness in human life, but instead is trying to paint a false picture of, uh, of, of life. Yeah. I mean, the church has always had trouble from the beginning dealing with mental illness. And uh, sometimes they falsely claim it to uh, demons. They falsely claim it to um, not going to church enough. Uh, and I think it's a great opportunity here for the, the church to, to gather around and, and have a, a great learning moment about mental illness. And mental illness, especially in the time of COVID and within the church and within the clergy. Um, we talked about taking sabbaticals and stuff like that. Um, clergy life is not easy in any realm, even uh, you know, conservative or liberal. Wherever you are within um, your walk within the church, clergy life is a difficult walk. And mm -hmm. uh, this is not the uh, and, first uh, suicide I've heard of in the in the clerical realm. And if you need time off to get your life together to get healthy, mm -hmm. that's take it yes just don't 
lie to us and say, well, I'm going to go study at a university and I'm going to go do this and that. Play golf. It's better to get your heart and mind in the right place if you could do so by playing golf or going fishing. If you need that at that stage in your life, that it is uh, to pad your resume for with another book or uh, an extra degree or something. Well, well, this is a serious show, George. What else you got in the news? <laughs> well, Indian corruption. Are you keen on that one? Well, I, you had a story. Or errors of fact in the in the love case. Well, hold on. Well, let's do the Indian corruption story because you had a story that you were telling me where both sides had accused each other of corruption both were correct and now there's a deal that's been made yes it, diocese in northern india i think it was chattanagpur i'm not certain but well so don't quote me on the diocese uh the bishop was deposed by the church of north india executive back in uh, late september early october because the bishop said i'm going to take my diocese out of the church of north india and I've got a green screen, Kevin. Can okay, you you're see still, me? Yeah, I, I see you. You keep talking. You're good. Uh, I'm sorry. That's right. Keep talking. Okay. The, 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 the bishop accused the National Church of corruption. The National Church accused the bishop of corruption. What's the truth? They're both right. The National Church deposed him. The bishop said, fine. The clergy back me. I'm taking my ball and walking away from the game. Well, this past week, they, they had a sit-down meeting and came to a deal. And if I were a filmmaker, I was thinking of the, the Godfather movies, of a meeting of the Mafia Ooh, and the Catskills with the Tony. big Cadillacs and Lincoln limousines <laughs> and the bodyguards. Yeah. So I think, whether, I think now uh, Rocco's got to kick 10% upstairs uh, to uh, the Godfather. Um, so much of the leadership of the Indian church is it's I don't want to this is a broken church it's a broken church it's a church I mean we talk all the time that has allowed sin yeah we talk all the time about the Episcopal Church and the Church of England and other churches adopting culture uh, India's church is is just reflecting the culture that they were brought up in. Uh, there is a lot of just built-in corruption. What we in the West call corruption, that's their system of work. Their system of work is bribery. Their system of work is bl uh, blackmail. Their system of work is uh, black market. That's just, that's just you know, they, they weren't brought up in the Ten Commandments. It, sorry. And, you know, Africa, we have an issue of sexual immorality. Huh? We don't have homosexuality. No. We have the Bishop of Zanzibar uh, on trial in a, in adultery. He's he's being charged in a civil case for alienation of affections because he got a man's wife pregnant and then paid for the wife to have an abortion. We have the Bishop of Upper Shire, Bright Malasa. His clergy held a press conference reporting that the bishop was having an affair with the wives of one of their colleagues. Um, the... Uh, Sexual immorality uh, in certain aspects of the African church is winked at. Uh, the way it's winked at in the Episcopal church in a different way of sexual immorality. Yes. Uh, right. One of the hard things for, 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 a, for a conservative Anglican who's looking for leadership and a voice in the wider world is sometimes we uncritically move that to a bishop far away who says the right things on the issues that matter to us, then he turns out to be crooked, like one of the founding primates of the uh, GAFCON, Valentina Mokiwa, was later deposed for being a crook and having children out of wedlock. And just, he had all the right theological opinions. He just was a Medici of sorts. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing. Um, I remember being a GAFCON one, I remember talking to a clergy person who said, you know, this would be this, a great way to start a new province in, in America, but long-term leadership from Africa and Asia isn't going to be there for us. 
once we get the ball rolling we're going to have to take this and, and move with it otherwise it'll fall apart within five years and the, this clergy person i talked to said this won't go five there's no way that this goes five because uh the americans can't do it and the, there's no long-term leadership from africa now we've gone more than 10 yay but i think he's writing that um and that's maybe why the leadership of GAFCON now resides in North America with uh, Archbishop Foley Beach. Uh, I just, there's just so many micro issues that the archbishops of other uh, provinces have to deal with. They don't have time to deal with uh, the bigger issues in the church. And um, some of those are corruption of their own bishops, sad to say. Uh, let's get to Bishop News. Uh, you posted a story on Anglican Inc that says Michael Curry and the people who uh, want to bring charges against Bishop Love got it wrong. They're okay with Bishop Love being brought up on charges, but darn it all, if you can't do it the Pharisee, like a, a good Pharisee, what's the point? What's the story, George? Oh, the, the bishops of Pittsburgh and Long Island released a letter this past week after the Love trial concluded. Bishop Love was found guilty of violating the doctrine and discipline of the Episcopal Church, and he accepted discipline by agreeing to retire uh, February uh, of next year, mm -hmm. but he's taking a terminal sabbatical after just January, December 31st of this year. Well, the bishops of Pittsburgh and Long Island said, I'm sorry to report, but there's some factual errors made by the court the first and most major is that Bishop Love did not violate the Constitution and canons because the this gay marriage thing that we put forward was a proposed revision of the prayer book. It was not a revision of the prayer book. The church court found Bishop, Bishop Love guilty of violating the prayer book's revision. Correct. And it didn't happen. And second, they found him guilty of violating uh, a clause, the uh, a clause in the resolution. Of not uh, of of the resolution, which said that uh, you know clergy must make accommodations and be ready to have gay marriages in their church, whether they like it or not. Now, the last part of that clause says, "But nothing in this shall abridge the right of the clergy to decline uh, to do this." The second half. The decline to do this was ignored by the court but the major issue is that they basically their whole premise of nailing bishop love was that he violated an a lawful change to the book of Cover. and the authors of this in committee at at general convention said this never happened now what does this mean for bishop love well he's declined to appeal so it doesn't really matter for Bishop Love it's over he's still retiring um, perhaps he could get an appeal in but I, I don't think there's the energy for that but what it does mean is that nobody can be nailed again by, on the same way that Bishop Love was nailed so the other conservative bishops in the Episcopal Church who may feel that the radar is now going to go in their direction have a defense that Bishop Love didn't have. Mm -hmm. Now, Bishop Love did have the defense of truth, except the court wasn't willing to hear it. Now, the, the defense of truth has been strengthened after the fact by the truth coming out. Mm. All right, well, that's all the news for Thanksgiving week. George, do you have any plans for Thanksgiving? Yes, I'm having lunch with some friends, the Carlsons, uh, down in Altamont Spring. <laughs> It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, we'll have Susan a... Susan and the girls are, are in lockdown out west, and so Susan's the first plane that she could get back is next week. Mm -hmm. So she'll be with our children for Thanksgiving, then she returns. All right. So yeah, I'll be we'll, working on the pledge campaign. <laughs> we work on the, the stewardship campaign. Yeah, we'll have a Thanksgiving dinner with you uh, in Ottawa Springs. That'd be a lot of fun. Um, people, I always uh, like to say a prayer, a, read, read a prayer during Thanksgiving for before we eat. If you have suggestions on your favorite Thanksgiving prayer, put them in the comments. Also, we want to see comments about sabbatical. 
what are your thoughts on sabbatical? Uh, George and I put down ours, and uh, we'd like to hear from you because uh, YouTube tells me most of you are clergy, so I'm sure you have an opinion on this. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I am the grossly unpopular George Conger after my opinions on sabbaticals. And you've been watching episode 633 of Anglican Unscripted.